Bounty Hunter BJ, a- a.k.a. Nino Cappuccino. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Man, it's uh, good to finally sit down and uh, get this in. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's long overdue, man. It's long overdue, man. We've been back and forth with it, so but we're here. We'll make it happen. Yeah, definitely. Well, I like to let my audience get to know you a little bit better. You know, I, I do got a pretty good uh, following out in L.A. and Chicago. Those are my, my main areas. So I'm sure my a lot of my audience is probably familiar with you, but they might not know, know your whole story and everything. So, um, you know, so where are you out of? Um, from Watts. From Watts. I'm origin. Born and raised Kansas City, Missouri, by way of Texas. Um, my bloodline runs from Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, St. Louis, Wichita. By way of Cali, the W-A-T-T-S, Watts. I landed in Watts in 1970 in the Miles Den at Watts Nixon Gardens, man. One of the hardest housing projects that exist. How old were you when you moved to Watts? I was a kid. I was a baby, man. I was, uh, shoot, um, seven, eight, not about nine years old, ten. And right to the Nickerson Gardens. Do you remember well, you know what it was like there well, at that it time? It wasn't actually right to the Nickerson. What, what, what happened was as um, average um, Americans um, who have a, a game plan and a, and a goal to set off to have a better life for themselves and to build a better life for their families, my father was an army veteran, first and foremost, and he spoke six different languages fluently. And um, he was my hero, my mentor, my everything, my teacher. My first teaching and my first guidance of a teacher came from home first. My father, my mother, and my grandmother. Because my grandmother taught in the elementary school in which we all went to. And so uh, my father set out to come out to Cali following one of his brothers, my Uncle Roosevelt Jr. My uncle came out here and he was an actual uh, army veteran as well. A couple of my uh, father's brothers went to army, they fought in Vietnam, like back to back. And so my father set out to come out to Cali to explore with his brother. And then once he came out here, he decided, you know what, I'm gonna make a life for me and my family out here. So in 69, my dad came out here and I came out here with him in 69. We stayed in a hotel on Central Avenue in Swan Hood, right off of 83rd. And um, he sent me back. And several months later, I came back with my entire family and we actually moved here. So he came out and planted seeds, uh, landed a job at um, LAX as an engineer. Uh, he worked at LAX and then from there he transferred from LAX to uh, Southern Pacific Railroad Union, which is where he retired from until upon his death. And um, that's how we ended, we ended up in the Nixon because my father ended up buying um, a whole corner a whole corner lot of property uh, for Broadway. And somehow my father ended up bellying up and went bankrupt at this time and lost a lot of money. Some, some around like the round of forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 at this time. And that was a lot of money during that time. And so we went bellied up and um, my father's dreams was kind of like shattered at that time as far as his goals. Cause he had bought into another lot with a business partner which uh, was going to be a diesel lot, an actual diesel mechanic lot where they built diesels and things of that nature. And um, like I say, something happened, it bellied up. My father lost a lot of money. Um, and so we had already had relatives living in the Nixon. And we had a set of relatives living in the jungles. So we used to go play in the projects and the jungles when we was young already. So we was familiar with Watts, and we were familiar with the west side of the jungles. Those two parts of Los Angeles was our only familiar, the familiarity that we were familiar with at the time as young when we first come out here. So instead of my father going west to the jungles, he went east to Watts. I had a cousin, like I said, my cousin Cecil was standing in Nixon, and my uncle Roosevelt was standing in the jungles, which is his brother. So we ended up in the Nixon, you know, the rest was history. We ended up in the Nixon in 1970. Uh, of course, my father didn't get a chance to uh, reestablish those goals and get us up out of there at a length of time that he had set for himself because his passing came about. You know, my father was stricken with cancer and I lost my king, you know what I mean? So that just took me to a whole nother level. So I, I ended up losing my king, my little brother, 17 years old, 
in between that and then my queen, you know, so I lost my father, my little brother, and my mama back to back, year after year, bro. So well, when was this? I, guess I was seven. I was nineteen, going on twenty. So kid oh, at that age, you'd already been in Nickerson Gardens for yeah, a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm already establishing a name for myself and everything by this time. So what was it like when you first moved to Nickerson Gardens? Oh shit, man, it was rugged, man. It was rugged, but beautiful at the same time. Uh, pro black, you know, straight blackness, a black community, community love, you know, people who love one another. Um, for me, I was fascinated with my big homies. Off top, when I when I seen the Pendletons and the Daishikis and the Afros and the Brims and the Hairnets and the Stacy Adams, I became intrigued from that shit off top and immediately, instantly. But I knew that I overall I had a different ball game for my life. My father and my mother had already planted these seeds. We already had. My goal was to to make it in life to become a you know, MLB player and an NFL player, man. I played ball hella good. I played football and baseball to the T, you know, and that was my way out, so to say. Even before poverty, I mean, that my, my that was my goal, my overall dream. If, if it was either that or my backup plan was to become an attorney or fireman because I was such a great debater already at a young age, I just knew that an attorney would be something great for me. At what point did you get mix, mixed up in the streets? Um... Okay, just taking us back, like I said, 1970, we landed in, in the Nixon, come 70, the gangs really started flourishing and merging in 73, 72, 73, 74, come summer 73, 74, about to, when it hit our hood and the actual, the name took place for us as far as our tag, our overall tag, the Bounty Hunters, um, it, it sparked my attention, but it didn't grab me. It hadn't grabbed me yet. It, hasn't, it hadn't pulled me in yet. It just got my attention. My body is still over here, but my mind is like wondering, like, damn, you know? Because like I say, now at this time, I'm looking up at my big homies, like my, my big homie Ray Boyce, rest in peace, all the Barker brothers, you know what I'm saying? Gary Barner, uh, you know, Pistol Pete, rest in peace. You know, this, the, the list goes on. So I'm looking at a lot of my big homies at this time who was growing up, who were in their early 20s, late 20s or early 30s at that time. And I'm just a young kid, 13, 14 years old. So um, what really pulled me in completely was the loss of my parents, bro. And then when I lost my little brother, it was a wrap. I took the red suit from him personally, him meaning the devil. I took the red suit, told him, give me that shit. I put the whole red suit on, Trey 57, and I became Killer BJ, AK Bunny Hunter BJ. And I just became destruction just massively, just tearing shit up. Anything that came in my way, anything that crossed my path, and if it wasn't for the Nixon Garden, and it wasn't about my family, I'm destroying. I'm tearing shit down. I was really with the business, man, when it came out of this B shit, man, this blood shit, man. So um, I would say 19... 77, 78, going to 77, 78, 79, I dialed all the way in. Now I'm physically in. At first, during those years, like I said, when I was a youngster, because it's a lot of us, we established, we're established like that in the beginning. You're from the neighborhood. When you're in a neighborhood, you're associated with that neighborhood. It's association no matter what. You don't have to be associated as the actual gang member or a gang a uh, banger, but you're associated with that neighborhood. So I was associated by living in the Nixon. Now I became a gang member by being fascinated with certain things. I start hanging out and I'm hanging out with gang members and gang bangers, but I'm still playing sports. So I'm torn between making this decision. But when I took that major loss of my family, oh, it was all heads on in now because it was like for a young man at that age, with dreams and goals and a vision already, and to lose everything that he believed in, which was my mother and my father, and my other half, which was my little brother, instead of me resulting to drugs, and then we talk about the crack epidemic, we talking about 1980, 79, 80, going into the 80s, the crack epidemic, instead of me resulting to dope, to drugs or doing dope, which I was already strong-minded as something I would never be able to, to do in my life anyway, I became volatile. 
My drug was violence. My drugs was beating the shit out of a motherfucker or gunning him down, busting his shit open, whatever it means necessary, whatever it took. That was my drug, bro. Hey, you mentioned playing sports in yes. high school. How, what was high school like for you? Um, Did you graduate? Yes, definitely, definitely. That was a must. It was mandatory. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, you say what was sports? What, what was, was high school like in general for you? Okay, well, high school for me, <laughs> gang banging. You know, again, living a double life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, one minute, you know, I, I got on a football uniform. I'm going to practice. Next minute, I got on goddamn uniform. I'm banging. I got on the Pennington red flags. You know, I'm, I'm banged out. So, for me, it was it was an experience. You know, it was experience of uh, living a double life. Of course, I got picked up um, for my first body, my first bodies, and attempted bodies at 17. So that took me out of my crazy of the public setting high school. I went to Lock High School. Um, I myself. I will say myself, my homeboy Chocolate, rest in peace, my road dog Renzi, AK Big Hook, uh, Frankie Huh, my homeboy Lumpy. Um, I'm going to say it was one more of us. And we are all active, though. We're active gang members from out of the Nixon. We had no business in Jordan High School, but we had the heart to enroll ourselves in the Jordan High School, so we went to Jordan. You feel me? Instead, as opposed to going to lock, we went to Jordan. Jordan was kind of pretty close to us, and then it, it was challenging. As as being gang members and gang bangers, we challenged ourselves to go to Jordan. We know it was the enemy school. We knew we would be outnumbered, but then we had big homies that was there, and we had homies that went to school there too. But they was considered neutral and cool, so they got a pass. You know what I mean? Because they weren't actual gang bangers or, 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 or gang members who was a threat to the Crips on that side. But when it came to us, you know, we were actual cats with names who were building names for ourselves. So, um, you know, it was like that was a no-no. So um, I got rushed in Jordan High School. My first, um, I would say, we'll give or take, we did at least about two months before they really came at us. It, it took them a minute to really congregate to come at us. And so what they did was, they split us up and they, they came at us one by one, one at, one at a time. So they caught me first. We had just had an incident where we um, we beat this cat up named CJ. CJ's brother, we beat him up, this cat named Joe from Gray Street, light-skinned dude named Joe, who was a known dude doing, back during that time. And um, we chased him down on our way to school, which was Markham. He went to Markham. So we chased him down in Markham, beat that ass. We went on to school that day. So... Um, I, I'm at lunchtime. I'm going to get me a coffee cake and a burrito, which is my normal program. And I see this cat from uh, First Town Mafia, which I had a couple of buddies from First Town Mafia that I fucked with over there: uh, J Jesse Murray, uh, Johnny Murray, the Murray brothers, uh, David Curtis, rest in peace. You know what I mean? With some, with some good brothers from over there that I knew. And plus, they were squabblers. They was fighters. I'm standing in line with them, getting my food, and we telling jokes and joking one another and cracking jokes. And I didn't notice. The crowd that swooped up, I didn't know the crowd that had swooped up during the lunch area, which was a flock of gray streaks. So I, I, my, my attention wasn't really on what was going on over there at the time, so I, I didn't notice it. And so um, I'm like talking to them, like I said, I'm clowning, we talking and conversing. And then I get my food and I turn around and I go to sit down at this table that I normally sit on. So I sit my food down and I go to sit down and as I'm sitting down, all I remember is I seen the cat walk up, he had a big ass afro and he was a little short huff, huff dude. And I looked, and when I looked up, nigga said, hey homie, your name BJ? And I looked at him, I said, what's happening? He said, yeah homie, I'm Joe. He said, man, y'all jumped on my brother this morning. I said, who is your brother? No, he said, I'm CJ. He said, my brother's Joe. And so at this time, I'm coming off the table, you know, to get in my stance because I already know these niggas finna rush me. It's, it's, it's going down. So as I'm coming off the table, full fired on me. Let one off. Bam. Hit me in my throat. Boom. I fall back. Boom, boom. Let off two. Catch one. Bam, bam. I'm hit the office. They come. 
I hit the office, check out. Immediately, they tell Mr. Jordan, he like, he trying to convince me to stay there because this, this is 1978, 79. They just won the city CIF championship in 78. So come 79, they recruit, they recruited us from Real Rogers Park. So I'm talking about, I'm, I'm balling with cats like Steve Parsi, Jerome Parsi, uh, Bennett, uh, cats who went on uh, to become NFL players or uh, college players, you know what I mean, at this time. So I um, I got checked out of Jordan, and then from Jordan went to Locke High School. And I got raided in Locke and went to YA for those bodies. And I actually beat, I ended up beating a couple, I beat the bodies, and they, they convicted me for attempted body, my first attempted body, which I paralyzed the cat. I stabbed him twice and paralyzed him. So that was the body that I ended up getting convicted on. The other, the other body, they actually gave me a body that wasn't my body. It was just my name had floated. And then they, the gun I got caught with, they did a ballistics match with it, and that gun wasn't the gun. It wasn't the match, so I beat that. But my daddy spent a lot of money trying to get me out of that situation because that wasn't the route my father wanted for me anyway in the first place at 17 years old, man, you know. So what happened with the guy? So you beat an attempted murder. Or, or you got convicted of attempted murder. Yeah, I got convicted of attempted ADW. Yeah, attempted ADW. Okay. And what would all happen with that situation? I went to YA. Okay. Yeah, I got five years YA, man. I went to YA. Shit, I did five years YA. So, so you're 17, you get five years in YA, and what's YA like for you? Oh, shit. Um, a penitentiary, uh, uh, let's just say, it prepares you for prison. It prepares you for the next big steps in your life. It was just like if you went to juvenile, if you ever been in juvenile hall, juvenile hall and camps prepare you for YA. So now YA, like going, you know, it's just being in YTS is the next step is dual, what they call dual vocational school, which is Tracy. So everybody who goes to YTS primarily from YTS and Preston is preparing you for Tracy. Solid dad. Those next those are your next steps. So, um shit, it's like like the average, you know, during that time, man. It was just it was a uh you recruiting a lot school. Of fights and, and oh yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. A lot of enemies there? Oh definitely, man. Definitely. You know, I mean shit. I was a shit starter, so you know, definitely a lot of fights because you know, I was I was bringing it to niggas, you know what I mean? It was like Is that, there that's any what that, it was about. The, there in particular that stick out? Oh well, uh yeah, um, this, I'm, I remember one time uh, the police set me up. Well, they just set me up a couple of cases. But this particular time I was in Coker and I was at um, level, I'm, a, I'm running um, B Yard. They rolled me up from B Yard. They catch me in. They rolled me up from B Yard. They sent me to Bedrock, which is the whole shoot program. So I'm in the shoot program. But before I get ready to go to shoot, they send me the classification. And the classification they send you, it's another section in the hole before you get ready to go get classified so you figure out if they're going to give you an indeterminate shoe program, if you're going to be in there for the rest of the duration of your time, or if they're going to give you two years in shoe, five years in shoe, whatever your time length is, you're going to find out your classification. So um, they had rolled me, like I say, rolled me up from another uh, quad and sent me to Bear Rock, sent me over here to shoe. So while I'm in waiting for classification, they send me to a section where it's actual, you get to come out, for wrecking for like an hour or two, they bust all the doors open, which is something that's not normal. You don't do this in those shoot programs. You let everybody out, meaning Spanish, blacks, whites, everybody get to come out. So during this time, it was our wreck time, which was the blacks. So that means the Bloods, Crips, Jamas, whatever associated is gonna come out. But now mind you, this section you're in it's not a segregated section because you haven't went to classification yet. So classification don't even know who's what in, the, in, in, in these, these um, cells right here. They don't know who's what yet. They don't know, okay, shit, we got enemies on top of enemies on the same damn tier right here right now. You know what I mean? Or in the same section. So they threw me in here, man, put me in a cell. I go in a cell. And it, it was crazy because specifically... It was my enemies who bought it to me because that's the way it was. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it, it was East Coast is on it on, on this particular um, cell block at the time. It was Hoover's, which I've never really had a um, really, really 
a lot of bouts doing my upbringing and banging against Hoovers because Hoovers was all more or less like um, a lot of allies to us, you know what I mean? And then my relatives are, are major figures from Hoover. My relatives are, are some of the dog callers from 107, you know what I'm saying? My relative is Big Sam. Andre Ransom, rest in peace, AK Devil. That's my relative, they're my blood relatives. So my relatives and them really made a difference over there. So I was connected with the grooves from 107s to the nine deuces to the eight trays, you know what I mean? The seven foes, you know what I mean? Five deuces, I got another set of relatives from 52nd, which was the twins and Gangsta T, you know what I mean? So I was connected with the grooves to the point where, you know, I, I've never really had no, no problems with, with a lot of the grooves. None of my upbringing, you know what I mean? I had a couple of fights in YA with a couple of them who didn't know me, but after the fact, after they found out who I was, then, you know, we became solid. But um, I'm in the room, I'm busting down. Like I say, they got me in this cell, I'm waiting for classification, I'm busting down. Busting down, I mean, I'm getting down, I'm doing my push-ups and my burpees, you know, staying right, keeping that wind right. And as I go down, I'm in a push-up position and I'm down. And I, all I remember is I looked up, I see the feet at my door already. Once I see the feet at my door, I hear a nigga say, cuz, where you from? You know, it's the hit up. I immediately, as, as, so I'm in my push up position. When he say, cuz, where you from? I jump right up, Barney Hunters, what's happening, blood? Barney Hunters? So I'm on one, I'm banging back. See, what that, what that great street like, nigga, Barney Hunters, killer? So we going at it, we, you know, doing our little dissing thing. But by this time now, it's two more great streets, hit the corner, hit the wall and walk. So now they literally in my cell with me. So it's me, I put my back against the wall, and they walk in the cell. So they got two here, two more come in. As two more come to the door, it's almost six heads. I already know in my mind, all six of these motherfuckers can't get me in this cell. It's impossible. They ain't gonna be able to get me in this cell, not beat me down, rat pack me, stomp me out. It's impossible. I'm not gonna allow it for one. Two is too many of them. And I know my fighting skills, and I know from just fighting in sales and I know how little they and small they are, these dudes gonna be trying to get me cause I got a name. So they gonna be trying to get me and to the point where it'll be wild, they won't be able to hit me. Couple of them gonna hit me, but the rest of them ain't gonna get me like they want me cause it's too small. Now if I was out in the opening section, then it'd have been a different ball game. So as I'm, like I said, I'm going back and forth with them, talking to them and I, I pivot, put myself in pivot position well, as I'm arguing with these niggas, I'm talking to them. So the nigga to my left, I'm talking to arguing with him, and bam, I fire. Boom, I just went on take off. Boom, fire nigga. We blend them. Boom, 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 boom. They on me. Boom, 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 So they mix me up, bust my eye, you know what I'm saying? Hit me in my eye, bleed my mouth and shit a little bit, get down with them and shit. The, the police hear the ruckus, and the police hit the tear, they break out. They get on. Get up. Hit the sink, wash my face off and shit, look at my face and shit, okay. But now two of two of the two of the dudes specifically I know. So I already in my mind say the first sight when I see them niggas, I'm I'm beating them. I'm I'm beating on them, you know what I mean? But that was um like one of my not strongest, but just a, a memorable point that I know where the odds was against me and um how I had to really prevail and come up out of that, you know what I'm saying? Average 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 blood, man, if he would have been a weenie, you know what I mean? Average blood wouldn't have sustained that, man. They you know they'd have had him. They'd have had him like cupcake, you know what I mean? But being that I was one of them NGs from the NGs, Knicks and Guards that wasn't wasn't going for none of the bullshit, homie, you ring, so it was a different ball game, man, you know. Okay. All right. Well so you do your time, you do your five years in YA. Well, actually I didn't have to do the whole five because you go to board, right? You go to board camp. So what happens is I end up doing two and a half, almost three and I, they paroled me. Okay. I convinced them that you know I was ready for parole, basically. And what do you do with yourself when you get out of jail? Oh shit, um, came straight home. I came home, uh, my homie Cyclone, rest in peace from APB, Miller Gangsters, man, OG Cyclone, AK Michael Bell, uh, Gangster Mike, White Mike, man, uh, Clee Bone, Sloan, man, Bone, uh, uh, my homies and them was getting money, man. They was getting real money. Like I said, it's the 80s, so they getting money, man. So at this time, they snatched me. So Cyclone came to the Knicks. He was looking for me already, so he snatched me and told me, man, look, man, you know, this the new, this the new wave going on right now, man. So, and the new wave was OT. So this is how me being one of the first descended from the Knicks and Gardens, I started going out of town 
and put the BH thing down, man. This is how I start representing the BH from a from a international standpoint. I was the first, the first out of my hood, not the second or the third, the first who had the heart, had the skills, and the vision to lead the Nixon Garden and take this game and spread it, man, and go get money. And so what happened was um, <clears throat> I got recruited into this, um, to this clique that we were all in called Eminem, Money, Mac, and Murder. And so uh, in order to be a part of this clique, you know what I mean, it was just like getting put on on the set. You know, you had to do something. You had to do something drastically. And so uh, that doing something drastically was, of course, taking your, carrying your own weight. We called it carrying your own weight at that time. It was like carrying your own weight. And carrying your own weight meaning that uh, <clears throat> Gangsta was the first who taught me how to take a binker, shaking, shake a binker into cookies. He was the first one who taught me how to cook crack cocaine into coffee binkers into the shape of cookies. We would take a whole bird, half a bird and a bird, step on them, hit them, stretch them, and the cookies. We look up, we got four or five birds. We just started with two birds to five birds. Now we got five birds. But now they all cookies, bro, like the size of a big chocolate chip cookie that you would go buy in the store today. They about this size. One big cookie is a half a bird, Cam. That's a half a bee right there, man. One cookie. Damn. You bust that cookie in half, stick it in a, a jockey strap. You feel me? You take them cookies, you put them in a jockey strap. So I took two cookies, two sets, which is a whole bird now, bust them in half, and you put them in a the jockey strap. Put the jockey strap on, put some boxes on, spray the jockey strap with some descendant, put it on, get on the airplane. That was the recruitment. That was the put on. Feel me? You play it at your own risk, you take your own chance. You make it through, it's on. And that's how we started. We established ourselves in that aspect. And I did that, I did that like, I ain't gonna lie, man, I ain't gonna front. I mean, you know, I, I, it, it's past 10 time. I've did time already for certain cases that I had dealing with the drug situation. But it was like, man, bro, I, I shit, I, I got addicted. Like, shit, when it, it was so easy because of course now we, we living in a different phase, different time zone, so the security phase was different. You know what I mean? Uh, airport security was on a whole different element. It was different. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? So it was like, shit, they allowed it to happen. They allow us to do it that way, you feel me? Because it was set up that way. I didn't create that shit, it was already created that way. I just participated, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so shit, man, I, it became fun and addicting, man, especially because, just think about it. You, 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 you not already set up your, your situation, per se. So when you land, you landing into, you landing, you're already landing into 40, 50, 60, 70, 100,000 is already waiting on you, cash, your money. It's already there waiting. You couldn't beat that shit, man. You know what I mean? As a black man living up in a poverty-stricken ghetto and getting that kind of money at that time, man, you couldn't beat that with a baseball bat. So shit, shit, yeah, man, I loved it at the time, man. It made damn good money, made a lot of money of it, man. You know, I made my first million dollars in my first early 20s. I made my first million illegitimate in my early 20s. I made my second meal ticket in my 30s, man. Me and my sister was crime, he's always had been. And she was my partner, my crime partner. The best crime partner I ever had was my sister. You feel me? When it came down to that life, the D-boy life, that was my crime. My other half, my sister, you know? Okay, so how long do you do this for? Do you get caught or, or whatever, how, what slows you down? Well, like, like a lot of things, man. One thing about me is I'm a thinker. I'm, I'm, I'm very wise, I'm intelligent, feel me? I'm articulate. I have enough sense, enough gift to gather, enough brain cells in my mind to know, okay, shit, enough is enough. Oh, hold on. Let me switch my game plan up. Or oh, let me do this. Let me try this. Or oh, let me seize this. I have enough sense to see that, enough vision to see it and know it when it's time. And this particular time, 
my calling was two situations. One, I want to say it was 1980. I had just got out right before I went in. So 1986, going in 87. i never forget this, bro. Ever, ever forget this. Scared the shit out of me. I sent my sis on a mission, right? I got a 1989 Lincoln Continental board out of this so clean, man. I got a mirror of me slaying a dragon with the ruby red eye out of his eyeball on my trunk. My sister drove that car, and I got it. It's on Hunter Spoke Dayton's and Vogue's. My sister drove that car from Cali to Texas to Kansas City to do a drop, right? And at this time, like I said, again, there's no discriminating myself by sharing this um, livelihood with you and with, with TV Land because I've already done the time for these things, but just I'm, I'm sharing a moment of education as well that these are not things that youngsters have to, the, the things that you want to do or get yourself caught up because I'm not bragging or boasting about none of this shit. Again, we're, we're, we're elaborating and I'm sharing my livelihood with you. So um, what I used to do is, um, it was doing, I, would, I would only move a certain time. See, I, I knew demographically when to move, how to move. I knew certain truck stops, certain time and elements, when to move and when not to move. So what I used to do is I would hit during Christmas holidays, Thanksgiving, those major holidays, right before the summer peak. I would, I would move quarterly in quarters. You feel me? And say, I could make 200000 this first quarter. And I lay down for the summer. I ain't doing nothing. I ain't moving. Let me just lay down. Let's, we we going to play it. So, therefore, to give me opportunity to find out if eyes is on us. We'll know if them boys watching us. We'll know because certain things that we're doing, we didn't switch our programs up. We had enough advancement of ourselves, especially myself, to know these things. So, the sign came when... My sister got caught up, my sister Demp, and one of my nieces, my oldest niece, um, she was on a run for me. She was going to do a pickup this particular time, this particular run, she was going to do a pickup, meaning she was going to pick up $80,000 of my money. And so uh, when she got to um, Kansas City, right, when she got there, she took the Greyhound this particular move. She, when she got off the Greyhound, she transferred to her, cax, to, her, to her cab. When she got in her cab, her and her, her, and her daughter, and she went to leave to go to the hotel. But before she get to the hotel, she get pulled over a car stopper. Boom. Car pulled us an unmarked car. It's the boys. They on my sister, bro. They on my sister Demps. Me up. So immediately the first thing, now just backing you up, when the car pulled over, they apprehend her. They already know her. They had washed her. They washed her and transitioned a couple times. Not dirty, but just money, carrying these bags, these luggage. So they, they washed her. So from that point, they had her connected with this cat who was my lieutenant at the time named Jordan. That's how they was able to connect her because they was watching Jay. This is how we got win. Remember I told you I take times out. And this was one of the times how we was able to find out because they was watching my guy from Kansas City, Kansas. So when they pulled up, pulled over my sis, man, they hit, hit her up, got her out the car, searched the car and everything. They finds the money. Get the money. During this time, my sister, my sister do hair. I had a, I had two different businesses that I had set up that was legitimate in Los Angeles that I was running my money through so I had businesses as a front as well and then um so they took my sister in man when they took my sister in I didn't get a phone call 24 hours I didn't get a call and I'm calling on the phone now I call I call my guy phone he not answering so I'm like oh shit what the fuck is going on down here like what's happening you know what I mean and so um within 72 hours I would say about, about 72 hours went by. Finally, I get a phone call. It's my sister. And as soon as she answered the phone, she talked to me in codes. And so as we talking, I said, no, 
did. I said, man, just put him on the phone, man. I said, I, I, I got it. She said, no, 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 no. Basically, what we what we talked about in code and what my what my baby told me was, if you do that, then it tears down all of us. Then we lose all the way all the way around the board if we lose you. So she was telling me don't turn myself in. Because I was telling her, I'm finna turn myself in, man. If they looking for me specifically, then I'm just gonna turn myself in. She was like, no, because they ain't, they ain't even asking about you on that level like that, basically. They wasn't on me, they was on my guy. And so about another two days went by, they released her, the money seized. About six more months later, they went and picked my guy up. They raided, they hit him. But at this time, we didn't pull it out. I didn't backed up off of Missouri altogether. I shifted. You know what I'm saying? So my last actual toll of everything was my 1988 run when um, uh, I had just picked up one of my little relatives uh, in the projects. I was giving her a ride to her, back to her house, dropping her off. And as I'm pulling up on 111 parking lot on 111th Street, in her parking lot to drop my little relative off. LAPD pulled over, pulled up behind me. I'm in a black bro ham at this time. I had just come from the jungles. I was in the jungles for about four or five hours. I was over there hustling all day. And so I had just come from the Jays. Later on that evening, back to my neighborhood. So I had a, a members only jacket that I had took from the homie. I got from my homie from the Jays. I got his jacket and put it on when I was over there because I just had a slingshot on and some corduroys when I was over there. So it started getting windy. So I took the member only jacket when I, <clears throat> I took him a whole thing basically. He didn't have the money for the whole thing when I got over there. So I, I sold him a half. So I'm still stuck with my other half. So I took the members only jacket, balled a half up, and I put it in the back seat of my bro. I just sit in the back seat. Now I'm standing outside smoking weed with the homies from Black Peach Stones and we chilling and doing our normal program. They hustling, doing their thing. We out there chilling. I finally leave. I drive my relative Casper off down the street on August. He's from the jungle. He, he's the original West Side PPS. So I drop Casper off down the street to Cass house. And so I leave and shit, man. When I get to the Nixon, I done totally forgot I put that dope in that jacket and threw it in my back seat. Mind you, it is now. I'm rolling in my broom, banging my sounds, I'm dipping, I make it to the Nixon. I pick my little relative up, go to drop her ass off, and get pulled over. They pulled me over talking about I ran the stop sign on Antwerp. I said, man, friend, I thought of I said, first of all, I ain't no damn stop sign on Antwerp, man. That's on the opposite side of the street. You a damn lot, because I couldn't have ran no stop sign, because ain't no stop sign right there. So as I come back around by Charlotte, and make my way on around 111, it's a bend, it's a curb. It's four-way stop signs right there. I stopped at all them stop signs. So anyway, that was their PC, I ran a stop sign. So when they pulled me over, <clears throat> basically, they, I got caught, man, with a pistol, half a bird, I had about $6,500 cash in my pocket, bro. And that was like, that was, that was my epitome right there, man, as far as my D-boy game, man. You're like, I can't, cause, that's the only times I've really ever did my time, you know, as far as that, you know, unless it was, it was for a body or somebody they picked me up for questioning for some shit that I didn't do or niggas threw my name, you know, say, oh shit, that's his, that's his M.O. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't got one, two, three, four bodies thrown on me that wasn't even my bodies, bro. I didn't have four bodies thrown on me before that wasn't my body. Picked up, take me down for questioning about some shit I had no idea about. It, it wasn't me. I don't know nothing about it. Did you have to beat them all, or did you just get questioned about no, it? No, just questioned, basically. It wasn't, it wasn't One, I fought. One time I had to fight, and I went in for a month. And that was just, see, what they do is <clears throat> they try to set us up, man, and break us and set you up to sit there and go plead on some shit. You know you ain't had no business. I ain't did none of this shit, first of all, but you're going to turn around and have me plead out just because you done bluffed on me with the Peter Pay Paul. You got these three counts over my head, three hard counts. And it's called what, they, what it's called is it's called a shotgun approach from a jurisdictional system. It's called a shotgun approach. One don't get you, one will. So this is how they tack you. They hit you with the shotgun approach, especially if you got a name out there in the streets, and then you got an mo in the system. They gonna hit you with the shotgun approach. So this is why you see all these young cats right now who's getting indicted. They got multiple counts. 
Those are called shotgun accounts. Feel me? One don't get you one wheel. That one to get you can still get you life. As opposed to five of these motherfuckers carry life by itself. Or, or the other five carry up to 20 years max by itself. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's a no win situation. You know what I mean? So, like I said, hit, hit hit me with the shotgun approach. And um, in 88, I went in. I got a three-year deal. I took a three-year plea. I pleaded out. Took a three-year deal for the um, the dismissal of the gun case. I take the drugs. Plead out on 11:35, which is 11:35. Is I'm a user, man. I'm a drug addict. Mm. You feel me? I'm a drug addict, man. You know what I'm saying? See, you, you got to know these things though. And as you growing up in that system and becoming a a pro perb and a paralegal, you learn the penal codes. You learn their wordings. You learn to talk they lingo. You know what I'm saying? So you learn how to defend yourself, which is something I was great at when I caught cases. I was great at defending myself and defending my honor. You know what I mean? I had an experience once in my lifetime which taught me then to never allow myself to be in that position and that was when I, I was faced with the Hawkins case, you know, back in 1984, me and my crimes, you know, uh, we, 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 we caught a high publicity case where we had a war, you know, we was at war with the Hawkins, you know, behind killing one of my little homies. And we all ended up pleading out on a case, you know what I'm saying? We pleaded out on the case and we all took deals on the case, every last one of us, all 14 of us. But, but within that plea, and the reason being that we pleaded out, we had to plead out, A1, the evidence that was against us, we had no win. We had two appointed confidential witnesses who had already so appointed. What was the Hawkins case? What were you guys being accused of? Um, well, I, I was I was being I was being accused as the conspire leader. So they booked me for conspiracy and multiple counts. Well, uh, what were the like, what was the crime? Tempted, tempted murder, murder, uh, firebombing of uh, funeral parlors, funeral homes, um, shooting occupied dwellings. Uh, shoot out with the police for three days and three nights with the Los Angeles Sheriff, SWATs. Uh, yeah, real shit, man. You know, this is a high publicity case. That, and, uh, now, took were place. they accusing you of doing the crimes or just being the leader? Yeah, myself, doing the crime, being a leader, and as well as uh, 32 other individuals. Well, which 32. Was, yeah, which actually, 30. it was about 34, 35 of us completely, and we became hood heroes in, in all eyes. We were Nixon Garden heroes at this time, bro, because of what we done and the stand that we took for our little homie who got killed by a grown man who was a hitter. This dude was a hitter. He was a he was a killer. This nigga was an instant killer, and he killed our little homie. So we took a stand, man. You know. And did you you took a plea on this? Yeah, we we played it out. Yeah, oh, we played it oh, out. Okay, that's right. You said everybody took a plea. Yeah, we played it out. How much yeah. time did you take? We we played it out because we 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 was um doing our preliminary, preliminary hearing. They brought in the confidential witness against us which was Ben Carr, a.k.a. Peptoes. Uh, they brought him in, and he got on the stand, and he pointed us out, and of course, that got us bounded over. So from that bounding us over, we bluffed on trial. We, what we were doing was, I had set it up where we was postponing our case. Each time we go to court, we were postponing by time. So that would put us out months at a time. So we end up doing a year in the county jail, fighting this case to finally now and, and then, then when, you, when you're fighting a case like that and then doing it that way, sometimes you would hopes and hopes that the witness would you know, change their mind or rekindle their statements or the witness would come to their senses or anything can happen you know, in, the, in the midst of this. So uh, <clears throat> being at the time we were running out of time now and that they literally had a solid confidential witness that was willing to come forth against us, I knew that okay, damn, we're not gonna be able to bluff on them at actual trial. So at least now what we could do is we try to continue to do what we're doing until they set us up deals. Cause they're gonna come at us. Before we go to trial, they're gonna throw deals at us. So the first thing they throw on the table at me was 14 years. They threw 14 at me and 13 at my homie Renzi and my crime. We ain't f***ing with it. A person dies and they're accusing you guys of taking retaliation for this person? Yes. I'm taking it? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes.
And now they're offering you 14 years? Yes. They're offering you guys all 14 years or 14, all different 14 sentences? years. And mind you, I'm 20 years. I just turned 21 at the time. I'm the oldest on the case besides my big homie who got picked up had nothing to do with the case. He wouldn't, shouldn't even been arrested. He shouldn't have been in, in preliminary, arraignment, none of that. But they picked him up because his name was on the list from buying, from the first confidential witness that we had against us in the original of the case. He put out a list of about 35 to 40 names. This is where the list came from originally. So by him producing this list, now the police already have a whole diagram on who did what and how it was done because this individual provided all the information up front. So now they take this to the district attorney. Tom Bradley get involved because Tom Bradley and Mr. Hawkins are road dogs. The state, this is partner. He put out an APB and tell him go get all them bounty hunters. Get every motherfucker who was involved, I want them, get them. So it became a high publicity case. You know what I'm saying? Mm, okay. And so now we they put us in the kangaroo court. So we go into a kangaroo court. We talking about a court like uh, El Chapo and them, you know what I'm saying, with the all glass and police security, sheriffs everywhere, because we was fighting with the sheriff. We we trying to beat, beat the police up in uh, CCB one court day, because they beat us up. They jumped on us, so we them up back. We got them back. You know what I mean? They handcuffed us and literally beat our ass. We, we, my little homies at this time were 17, 16 years old in juvenile hall. I'm the oldest nigga in, on the county, in the county, and the rest of my homies 19, 18 years old. We kids. Motherfucker, the big old poly ain't jumped on us, bro. So, okay. So we go back. We got a court date coming back in two weeks. We come back with a game plan. So we, we okay, all right. So I'm, I'm muster us up a plan, and we execute that plan. So soon we get on the elevator. I come out our handcuffs, blah, 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 and we whoop that ass on the elevator, two of them. Wore, wore that ass out. Yo, yeah, we they beat us again, beat the shit out of us. But we wore their ass out, though. And from that point on, they shackled us from going to court. So they were, we come to court like this from head to toe, shackled from here on out. They wouldn't take them handcuffs off of us. So when we got off the bus, we shackled. Every day we come to court, we shackled. You know what I mean? The only persons ain't shackled is the juveniles. And there was three of them in juvenile. So, again, like I say, what we did was... We, we, we basically, we did something very heroic, man, as far as for our neighborhood and just just us being solid individuals, man, you know. Um, we what, what was the outcome? How much time did you end up take, taking on that? We pled it out. Like I said, we pled it out. I ended up getting four. The max was six. So I, it was four, four, five, four, three, three at the most. Three was the lowest. But most of us, we got fours, five, threes. And my little homie, little Louie, B-Bone, Ended up getting six because his mama split him up from us, put him in a, in the worst position of the worst, and he ended up getting six in trial. When he when they raided his house, had all the evidence against the world against him, which was the dumbest thing for him to do to go to trial. But he ended up with the max, which was six, because he was a juvenile. So the judge gave him six years, which was the max. He wanted to give him more if he could have, but he was a juvenile. He was only 16. So we ended up going to YA. I mean, excuse me, not YA. We end up all going to the penitentiary, tearing the prison system up, do our time, and then we parole. Okay. Uh, now, I believe I've heard you mention a little bit about the blood module in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. what, what was that like for you? You mean my experience in the blood module? Yep. Oh, shit, man. It was, it was experiences on top of experiences, man. For one, A1, um, I was there when the first blood module was established. I was one of the founders and one of the actual, you know what I mean, one of the dog callers of the blood module, 32, 3500. We come out of the pill module first and foremost. Peabody was established in the pill module and a lot of the homies who was coming in the county jail at the time would go through the pill module to get medication. And this is how we was able to communicate with each other. But we own different different modules and shit on the main line. But you'll get a pass to go to the pill module. So by us doing this and coming to the pill modules, we were able to see one another and communicate. So when we start recognizing that it's 15, it's 20 of us spread it out in the county jail, damn, it's 15, damn, okay. Five more just came in and got booked. Oh shit, Santa Claus, Baptiste and them from the 20s just came in 10 deep. Oh shit, so now it's 30, 40 of us. 
but we all in the pill module. We all down there trying to get in the pill module so we can be together because we outnumber, bro. It's 20 to 1. It's 20 to 1, man. No exaggeration, no bullshit. And niggas is really cripping. Crips is really cripping. Ain't no fake cripping. Ain't none of this millennium crip shit. Niggas was really cripping. You feel me? It's like you had to be a real blood, a real B-Dog, nigga, to represent this B-Dog shit. That's why niggas like me sitting here in this chair today, reason why you youngsters out there, you fake youngsters out there representing this B-Shit, man, is because cats like me and other real cats, bro. And I'm not saying that to, bra to brag or boast, but just saying that as facts, man. You know what I mean? Facts. Just like can't nobody stop this war but us, bro. Can't nobody stop this war but us. And we can do it, man. So me being on the blood module was uh, definitely an experience. It, enha it enhanced me. It enhanced my chapters of life as far as being a blood, uh, being one of those individuals from Nixon Gardens, being one of those real uh, uh, reputable bounty hunters representing the Nixon Gardens. Um, it was an experience, man. You know, definitely an experience for me, man. You know, uh, I can recall this time. Um, I remember one of the worst days, one of the worst days of my life, bro. One of the worst days and moments of my life was I was due to go on a visit, and um, my visit got quashed because this particular female popped up and came down to the county to see me. I'm not knowing my mother and them was coming down. So my big homie, like I said, my big homie in the, in the county jail was at this time, he on the case, and he don't even supposed to be on the case. I'm in cell 12. My crimey, which is my road dog, Hook is a cell 11. Snoop is about four, two to three cells down from us, so Snoop would be in like eight or nine. But all these cells in Charlie were all bounty hunters. So everything on this top tier, all my homies. Then I got a couple downstairs. I'm in the middle of the tier. So uh, I used to do this bunny hunter chant. I started this bunny hunter chant. I used to do this chant, which one of my little homies turned it to a song. They brought it to the streets and made it to a song, which was OFTB. But it created out of the county jail from us. So I need to put that on record. That hey bunny hunter, hey bunny hunter came from us, bro. Created in Nixon, created in, in 32,500 from the bloods from us, man. You feel what I'm saying? And that was our late night chant before we got ready to lay it down and call Usalama. I mean, Usalama mean quiet time. We're going to sleep. Everybody's on quiet time. It's shutdown time. If you're talking, you have to whisper because people are going to court. So it was a respect mechanism. It's all protocol. So uh, I started a lot of trends, bro, in my era of my time, too. So uh, <clears throat> this particular day, like I said, I was, I was due for a visit, and um, I didn't get my visit. So a couple of my homies went out on visits, and my big homie Snoop was one of my homies who went out on visits. My homie Murph Dog, uh, Joe, Joe Page, they all went out on visits this particular day. And so uh, I, I, I will never forget this moment, bro, because again, I'm in my cell, I'm busting down. Bam, bam. I'm busting down and shit. We got court, we gotta go back to court in three more weeks. So, I'm in my cell busting down, and all of a sudden, you hear the gates opening up. People are returning back from visits. You hear the gates open up. You hear the, the, the officers say, um, okay. You heard him say, okay. So Snoop was coming to my cell. He told the police, hey, I'm finna go to the cell. Woo, woo, I need to holler at my homie. So big Snoop came out of my cell, and uh, he crouched down. I never seen my big homie, I never seen him with this kind of face expression. You know what I mean? It's like, we mean niggas. We, you know, we consider this mean dude. So I, myself, him, rat dog, cats like him, hook, rip, you know, we got these particular looks. So people call us mean all the time. So I'm not used to seeing his face the way I seen it that particular day. So when he walked up to my, to my cell gate and he looked at me, I looked up at him, I got up, I looked up at him, I walked up to the guy, I said, what's up, homie? He said, blood. And he shook his head like this. He said, he said, beat, man. And he just shook his head. He said, beat, man. He said, mom's came down for you. I said, oh, shit. I said, man, that bitch fuck my visit up. Ooh, and I'm talking to him. He said, oh, beat, man. He said, beat, man. Rico, man, Rico. And he, he just said my brother's name twice to me, right? He said, Rico. 
He said, man, your mom's, he said, man, your brother gone, man. Your brother, man, Rico, man, died, man. And he just shook his head like this, he man, he died. And I looked at Snoop, I looked him right in his eyes, bro. And the last I remember, I just let out a, a big ass roar, I hollered, I screamed. The whole, I mean, the whole county jail can hear that scream, probably a pain, bro. That's how much pain it was. I just screamed, I let out. And I told Snoop, get me out here, blood, get me, I need, get, get, get me to the phone. So he went to the deputy, bust my gate open. I go out, use the phone, I'm on the phone, and I call my moms and them, and boom, they told me. So we had yard that night, yard, which is the roof and day room. So you got the option to go to the day room or go to the yard. So some of us went to the yard, some of us went to day room. I needed to use the phone, so I stayed down so I can go to the day room so I can use the phone. And plus, I'm a trustee. I run the module, so it's like, I'm on the phone talking. Now, mind you, at this time, this ain't an all blood module. This is a blood and crip module. You got bloods on 3,500, crips on 3,200. So the crips got Denver and Abel, Denver and Charlie. We got Abel and Baker. You know what I'm saying? So that means we sharing a whole module together. Showers the whole nine, but we come out separately. Now what the police normally do is, you had sheriffs who became bloods. You had sheriffs who became crips. Straight up. Really, I'm talking about really crip sheriffs. Favored the crips, favored us. Meaning they would do for us and they would do for them. Meaning they gonna bust gates open. They gonna turn their head the other way. They see drugs, the whole, they, they, they with the business, man. You feel me? So, they used to bring us out and like 20, 40, 50 at a time. Like you may see 40, 50 Crips coming out. And they'll say, lock down! And everything stop. You know what I mean? Like if you in the hallway, you gotta stop right there where you at. Face against the wall, blues, nose on the wall. Hands behind your back. And you being escorted by sheriffs. And here they come, they escorting a the whole line of Crips. And it's a line of bloods right here. So imagine being in these situations, bro. Rise on top of rise was jumping off. Beatdowns on top of beatdowns was jumping off behind that type of shit, bro. You feel me? Again, like I say, this particular day, once, once, once my homie told me this information, this news, I was f***ed up, man. And um, the homies is in the day room. The homie Tweet from Swan used to joke a lot and around a lot. So Tweet was playing around in the day room with somebody and a couple more homies. So they in there f***ing around. And then my homie Kiki um, was tussling with somebody in the day room. They tussling. So the police um, come to the day room door, tell them to knock it off. So at this time, they're going to escort. They racking the gate, letting a couple of visitors come out. The scripts. They letting visitors come back to Crips. Now what this jackass don't do is, instead of him taking the handcuffs off them and sending them straight down the module, he sent them in the laundry room and take the handcuffs off the Crips. Now that's four, four of us on the phone, just bloods, right? And a couple of other regular trustees that's on the phone. So we, I'm on the phone, I'm on the end phone, which is, hangs right next to the day room, damn near. Like, I can be on the phone and touch the day room window. You feel what I'm saying? Or touch it with my leg like that. So as I'm on the phone, I'm in between the phones, bro. Now at this particular time, homie, I'm on the phone, I'm boo-hooing, my nigga. I'm boo-hooing, and I'm like, I don't cry, bro. But the loss of my parents and my little brother me up, tore me down to tears but tears of anger. I'm killing, I'm destroying any and everything. You ain't about this blood shit, nigga. I'm destroying the enemies. So that's on my mind. But I'm on the phone, I'm crying, I'm boohooing to my sisters, man, I'm, I'm talking. And I hear niggas say, cuz. And he threw a crib sign up on the window, boom, to the homies. Now the homies is in the day room, on him, boom, 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 boom. They beating on the wall, blah, 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 blah. And they arguing with the food, and the food threw up a cookie sign on the window. That's all I remember. I let him throw up the cookie, and I dropped the phone, I turned around, and I hit that with a haymaker or something so vicious. And I caught him right here in his, between his throat and his neck, and I knocked his ass straight to a Caesar. One blow, one punch. That's how much anger I had within me, man. You know what I mean?
just thank God I didn't have a weapon because I probably would have killed that dude on the spot. Be on death row somewhere, man, just that quick. But I hit him with so much anger, bro. I hit him and spent him, boom. And, and when I hit him, I went to go stomp him, but I seen him <gasps> going into epilepsy. I said, Deputy, crip down, man. Nigga having a season. I jumped back on the phone. Start talking to my sister now. Beep, beep. Whistles go up. Beep, beep. Police come in. Beep. Beep. They rush us. Look at us. What happened? Ooh. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm on the phone. Run us in the day room. You know what I mean? But just, just those moments like that, bro, it's just, just things that, you know, I remember distinctly this, this from experiences of being in situations like that, man. You know, just being in them, in them, them, them hell holes, man. You know what I'm saying? What do you think was like the wildest time, like, you know, uh, riot wise or fight wise in, in the blood modules? Well, you see, well, it's funny you asked that question, man. And um, I want to say this, like, there's a lot of comparison today, right? Which there ain't no comparison. So I want to put this out there for the record. I want to say this for the record for all the new millennium gang bangers and all the new millennium so called gangsters out here, right? Uh, bro. In 1970, late 70s and the 80s, we call it the bloody 80s. If you wasn't cut a certain way, homie, you wasn't with these streets. Now you go ask your mama, you go ask your daddy, you go ask your big uncle Louie, you go ask your uncle Raymond, all I'm gonna tell you this damn same, they gonna tell you the same. If you wasn't cut a certain way, bro, you wasn't around in these streets in the 70s and the 80s. See, that's the difference of the day, is the streets is watered down. So you got a little bit of everybody just out here in the streets, male and females. See, it wasn't like that in our era. You didn't have females in the street like you got females in the street today. They wouldn't, they wouldn't dare, they wouldn't in the streets. It, it was, it was, you had you had options and then you had choices. It's like you had options and you got choices today. But our options, our choices was just different. Today, their choices and their choice of of, of high is multiple things. So with this high, it takes them into an elevation of doing stupid, radical shit. We gangbang for some shit that we thought was a cause. So we had a cause, bro. You know what I'm saying? So when we woke up, we woke up with a cause. I'm going to get the enemy today. Or the enemy thought the same way. I'm going to get the enemy today. So that was our cause. So it's a difference. There is no comparison. These niggas don't wake up with no cause. Their only cause is destruction. Get high. Anything that's in the way, f it. So it's a different element. You know what I mean? So in the in the seventies and the eighties, bro, there would never, ever, ever be no comparison on how it was then, man, because it was dangerous. It was detrimental, bro. And I could kind of say it is a repeated cycle to an extent now, but only it's not Los Angeles. It has flourished by coastal. East Coast, West Coast, North, South, Chicago, New York, Baltimore. You got all these major cities who once upon a time, they had crimes going on in their city, but they didn't have a gang wave criminal element going on in their city where they had multiple deaths occurring behind bullshit gangs and gang banging or mimicking Los Angeles gang bangers. You know what I'm saying? I say this, bro, and I say this again for the record. There's a whole lot of cities out here, America. A whole lot of cities. And I have so much respect. And shout out to Uncle T while I'm speaking on the man. Shout out to big Uncle T, man, from Baltimore, who's a community activist of the city who does great things down there for a city. And his whole mission is to save these kids, man. And that's what I'm about, saving the kids, bro. Giving the kids a chance. Why should we continue to stand out here and up or, or claim these streets to be ours or claim these hoods or claim this block when well, none of us own this shit. We don't own it. We don't maintain it. None of it. So then why not take this energy that you have and this influence that you have and let's reverse this shit and say these kids. Stop the kids from mimicking what you're doing now. Stop the kids from who's going to grow up in the next 10 years, which is a decade, and stop that decade from deteriorating, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, I hear you, man. Yeah. So my thing is, I'm really, really about change at the end of the day, Cam. It's not about 
you know, you got a lot of cats come on your show, you got a lot of dudes on, on your show that's OGs, bro, that has been on your show. And I've never ever heard nobody get on your show, bro, that's an OG. And I've never heard none of them cats talk about their families. I've never heard none of them really share the significance with you about their kids. See me, I'm a devoted father, homie. A lot of people do come on here. We do talk a lot about positive stuff. Okay, well maybe Melvin, Melvin, I, I, I don't know about I don't know about family wise, but Melvin Farmer comes on here and we talk about the stuff he does with the community. Um, you know what I'm saying? Other dudes, you know what I'm saying? We definitely have covered. Okay, well a maybe lot I just haven't seen those stuff. particular interview, but just channel. sorry, I'm just saying I don't. I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying from 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 a man's perspective, man, as to us being OGs, I'm saying at some point. When do you grow? You know, you you know, gee, man, you did your shit, all right. When do we grow? When do we lead by example? So that's what I mean by that. Me, bro, it's like I deliver my kids. It's like you would ask yourself, as a gangster slash ex gang leader, man, and a gang member, what are you doing delivering kids? How do how do how do you do that? Who does that? I did it though, and I'm I, and I'm talking about in the midst of my gang banging stages at that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I said, I'm just drawn. As a devoted father, man, I'm drawn to my kids. I live for my kids. I breathe for my kids. So this is why it's important for me to see change, bro, to see, you know, the element of this shit change and, and turn around as far as the gang theory go. You know what I'm saying? All the ruckus that's going on in the streets, all the, the miscellaneous killings that's going on throughout America, period. You know, throughout all these communities, period, man. You know what I'm saying? No, I hear you, man. That's That's... I mean, you know what I'm saying? That's dope. You know what I'm saying? Like, people get older and they're able to actually have an impact on their community and, you know what I'm saying, actually slow some of the bad situations down, man. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, definitely, man. So, like, but, yeah, like you say, but just my experience overall, you know, just taking us out of the blood module was crazy, though, but just my experience overall of it, like I said, uh, it was something at that time that I believed in. Um, I would have died for, you know what I mean? And uh, shit, it is what it is, man. I, I I did it at my best, with my best, man. With some of the best at that, man. You know what I mean? So if I had to do it all over again, would I do it again? Hell to the no. Shit, no. I'd be a billionaire two or three times, man, before I go resort to the streets all over again and do that shit all over again. Shit, no. Shit, no. Yeah, you know, I hear you, man. That's what's up. I seen you had a situation with Lil Wayne, Juvenile, the Hot Boys, and everybody. We kind of helped them out of a bad situation. Yeah, and I, <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy, man, because this internet, boy, this internet will chew you up, man. If you ain't, if you ain't accurate on your dates and your times, well, these motherfuckers critique on this internet, man. But any, anywho, yeah, Lil Wayne was like 15, bro. 15. It was Lil Wayne, BG, uh, Turk. Jewy wasn't there, cause I met Jewy. After after this incident, I met Juvie two days after this incident occurred. Then I turned around and connected with Juvie, and me and Juvie ended up connecting. I met Juvie, and we connected for a couple of years with the whole UTP squad. But I happened to been in the Jordan Down Projects, man, during the Peace Treaty era. I, I was in the Jordan Down Projects over there, and I was over there getting some bud and uh, hollering at a few niggas I knew from over there. So I'm hollering at a few cats I knew from over there and getting some bud. And uh, in the transition of it, I'm ear hustling. You're hustling me, you know, got my antennas up. And the baby Lokes is in the parking lot I'm in. I'm in a, this particular parking lot called Dust Town. And I'm going to get some weed from from from, from my pot of chocolate, man, chalk over there. And uh and as I'm I'm going to get my bud, I hear him I hear him talking about the hot boys. Now the hot boys became familiar with me at this particular time because I had to change my label. I had to change our name. I had to change everything that we were coming out with. I had to change and switch it up. Because for a whole year, we were CMBs in Watts. Cash Money Brothers. And I took the idea from New Jack City. So that's where I took the concept from. Just like when I established um, multiple spots in my neighborhood, I was one of the first who established multiple drug houses in my neighborhood. And I took that concept from New Jack City. That's how I was able to establish my first five legitimate spots in my hood. And what I did was I demographically covered every central area in the projects. I had a spot on 115, 
one on the four, which is I'm from 114, 112, 111, and some more. So I was I I've covered the whole dimension of my projects. I had spots in every area in those dimensions. And so uh <clears throat> this and so coming 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 from that frame of mind, like I said, I'm in, in the Jordan Downs and I'm chilling and I'm ear hustling and I hear them talking about the hot boys. And their integral conversation was an integral plot. Oh, we finna go get them fools, low. So immediately I'm like, uh, okay. Let me go, let me go play savior. Get me some money right quick. You know what I'm saying? Because it's the name of the game. And uh, so I shot over there to the record company, VIP, and they had a record, they had a record, not a record company, but an actual record store in their neighborhood at the time, right on 103rd. Uh, I believe it's called uh I want to say not Taco Pete, but it's a taco stand now on the corner. So famous taco stand in the Jordan Downs on 103rd, right across the street from the elementary school. Then it's a laundry mat. Then it was a store. It's like three or four more little shopping, like little, uh, little um, shopping spaces right there, right, for businesses. One of them was the VIP record store. So... At this time, you got Big A out of Compton, you know, Big A from Rufus Records, Big A record store, his brother, they broke in artists. Then you got VIP off of Wilmington, which was Tricky from Long Beats. So all these th these was our major record stores who was breaking records and breaking artists at the time, including this one in Watts. So they were coming to the store to do a record signing and do an appearance. That's why they were there. It was three three Mexican bodyguards, Lil Wayne, BG, Turk. When I walked in, I walked straight in. I, I, I looked right at Lil Wayne, not knowing who he was at the time, though. Looked right at the little dude, little youngster with some dreadlocks. I mean, not dreadlocks, little short haircut, short, looked like a little kid. I looked at him. Looked at the other one. Boom. So I walked straight up, say, hey, homie, who y'all role manager or your manager? Dude turned around and pointed at the roadie. I told him, hey, homie, check this out. Walked up to him, introduced myself to him. I said, homie, I'm, I'm Big Nino Cappuccino, CEO of Paper Chase Entertainment. You know what I'm saying? I'm from Nixon and Gordon Bonnie on his homie. I said, look here, homie. I said, I'm doing you dudes a favor, man, by giving you a heads up. But y'all got to get up out this situation, bro. Some shit finna go down right now at this store. You feel me? Dude shook my hand, gave me a number, told me to contact him, had me fire racks. Threw them in the van, got them up out of there. My little homie Hameen called me. Like later on that night, called me. We on the phone having a conversation, and he called me saying, Big homie, I got Jew number for you. You need to connect with Jew, man. Go make that connection. I made the connect and got his number for you, big homie. I said, You bullshit. He said, No, I got him. I called the number. It's Jew. Jew was out here on tour at the time now with his UTP crew. So I went over there, introduced myself, hooked up with Jew. Me and Jew became cool, and me and Jew started doing some things together. You know what I mean? Uh, I just like the time, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we probably don't have time to tell the story now, but I had to come back and tell you one day, man, about the time when Young Buck got stuck in the Knicks of God, got sprung and stuck in the Knicks of God. Yeah, Young Buck, I ain't told y'all that story online, huh? He ain't told nobody that story, how he got stuck in the Knicks of God. With them Nixon Garden hunterlets over there, man, and that, and that pure white man over at Nixon Gardens, yeah. Young Buck got he got trapped up in there. Man, we got over there, and got stuck with my homies, got stuck. Now, not stuck as far as beat up. This was do, this was during the time. Remember when when they said Juvie left him, yeah, in L.A. Well, he was over there with us. Mm. He was with us for about a week, sprung in the Nixon till he finally they finally got up out of there. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Got over there, got sprung on some of that good Nixon pussy, some of that good Nixon dope, man. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, true facts. Yeah, they don't talk. See, certain things they don't talk about, huh? <laughs> Boy, I tell you, man. <laughs> now, was Little Wayne, I think you said somewhere he was like wearing a purple rag or? Well, see, yeah, see, during this time was, that's why they were over there. See, during this time, it, it wasn't no set. Now, I made this statement about if. Lil Wayne and the Hot Boys and them wouldn't have met uh, met the homie Mac 
if Mac Ten would have went down there and signed on them, man, and put the put the flame in that shit, man, them dudes would have been great streets. I stand on that and I say it and I stand on it. They would have been great streets. You feel me? Because the great streets had already had them. The Jordan Downs already had it. When they first came out, that drop it like a hot, I believe it's that drop it like a hot record or uh, where they dancing and drop it like a hot. When they first came out that record, they was promoting it. Man, they did a concert in the Jordan Downs, but they ain't never come to the Knicks. They went to the pro to the Jordans first, and when they went to the Jordans, cause the Petey the Petey World squad, the Petey World Petey World squad was some of the hottest rappers at the time, and Dro was one of their hot rappers out out of the projects. So I know what the f I'm talking about. And Dro was hollering at them niggas and with them. Dro was signed to um uh to uh 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 uh, uh, uh um. Russell Simmons at the time. Dro had just signed the deal with Russell Simmons doing all this hot boy situation. So that's just how, this is why they was collaborating and they was over there dealing with him, bro. So I know for a fact, and I'm saying this based on, that's just like if the hot boys was over in the Knicks and Garden, they was with us. Eventually they gonna become bounty hunters. They gonna be claiming the Nixon. Even though they rappers, they gonna be claiming, what, what is Rain claiming right now? Pyru, right? So they were gonna be claiming the Nickerson. So if they would have been over there still with them, they would have been claiming Gray Streets, bruh. Straight up. I stand on that. I don't bite my tongue for nobody with that shit. It's the truth. They was flying purple rags and wearing purple colors at first. In their first video, go to their first video, damn it. If you don't believe me, go to their video and see it for yourself. You'll see them with purple shit on. You'll see the Gray Streets in the video. You'll see them. So this is why I say that. I'm not saying it based on just because. I'm saying it based on from our streets of Los Angeles and our politics and the way shit goes and the way these old fake ass rappers aren't from the streets really and become somebody and you got fame and stability to be able to do other things in your life. You want to claim some funky ass streets that you're not from. That's ass backwards to me, bro. You know how I many guys in the streets are begging to get out these streets, man? You know how I many dudes in these streets just wish they had a, just a little bit to go on to leave the streets, brother? It's cats in these streets that don't got no money, don't got a dime. The, 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 if I could just move out of here, man, if I just had the money to just leave, can't leave. But then you got dudes who's fortunate enough to make it to the top for success. They want to claim some gang shit, some crip and blood shit. And you worth a mi you a self-made millionaire. You a millionaire. You worth a million. Not to mention, you made four million in the last three years. But you want to claim a blood set or a crip set. Man, you stupid niggas is backwards. Backwards. This is why a lot of that shit is coming to hold like it is. This is why it's, bro, it's a curse, homie. I can't put it no other way. It's a curse. Think about it. You got, now the streets aren't even the streets no more. I seen at one point there was a situation with Snoop and Mike Jones. They were shooting a music, music video out here. Mm-hmm. And, and something happened. Are you talking about Mike Jones, Bun B and uh, Snoop? Yep. Uh, you talking about um, when Mike Jones had his hot single out of uh, My Six Four? Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was the um, beginning and the um, embracement of me and Bun B. You know, me and Bun B run, and um, we own a record label together, Two Trill ET, Two Trill West. Two Trill Enterprise and Two Trill West. This is what the Two Trill West branched off from, the Two Trill Enterprise, and that's how it was established. But um, we built the 12, 13-year relationship and bond based on, I ended up saving the situation for them. And how that occurred was, um, <clears throat> I was on my way in transition again. I was on my way to an audition, and I got a phone call from Chino XL. And Chino called me, and you know, Chino, they think I'd be animated. Chino be animated, man, you know. So Chino called me, and he's like, yo, Cap, son, where you at, son? Son, I need you, man. We need you over here, man. And I'm like, X, what's happening? What's up? Talk to him. He's like, son, they finna rob everybody. Everybody. Everybody's gonna get it, man. They finna rob everybody. Snoop, Mike, Bun, I'm here with Bun, man. I'm here with Bun, Cap. I'm here with Bun, man. I'm here with Bun, Cap. I say, X, I'm on my way to audition though, man. He's, I'm, I said, man, where you at? So he told me he was in, he was in the avenues. He was basically, 
he was in V and G hood. They was in the border between V and G's, and you got five fives, you got the five sevens, you got five dudes. He he he's in smack dead in the middle of Crips and Bloods. They had a church, this this border centered right between the both of them, in the avenues, but primarily V and G hood. So they shooting a video scene at this church. This is how I met and developed a relationship with Dr. Teeth. Dr. Teeth was the director at the time. Shout out to Dr. Teeth. And so, uh, anyways, when, when Chino gave me the information, give me the location, I turn around, call my agency, and tell them that, basically I lied to them and told them I'm, I was gonna be like an hour too late. And so, um, I turned around, shot over there on the set, and when I pulled up, at this time, by the time I pulled up now, um, they're making their way towards the church. But now the security, the, the, the couple of security they have, they have a gate. They have like one of the rollaway gates at the church. So they're trying to close, they close the gate. The gate is closed, but now you still see the crowds. You got a crowd here and a crowd here. And they're coming to, the, they're at the gate and they chant and they motherfuckers like that shit. Tell us such and such, come on out of here, homie, holler at us, da, 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 you know, and cats is getting at them. So I pulled up. When I pulled up, and of course, in order for me to get in, I got to drive between this crowd. So when I pulled up, I hit my horn, I pulled up in my truck, and when I pulled up in the crowd, I pulled right up to the gate. Instead of me parking, I pulled up to the gate. So when I pulled up the gate, I'm hitting my horn, boom, boom, boom. So I come out of my truck. When I come out of my truck, you can hear blood over here, you can hear cuz over here, you know what I mean? Blood, cuz, and... When I come out of my truck, I come come out of my truck, and I stood up on my truck, and I'm looking out the gate, and I'm telling the security, where Chino at? And the security say, who is you? I say, homie, I'm Nino Cappuccino. I say, man, go get Chino XL, man. So by the time I'm telling him this, X is already telling him, open the gate, let him in, let him in, let him in. So they open the gate, let me in. But as I'm getting ready to go in the gate, I look around, I turn, I look, and I look, and I whoop, so whoop, I go bird. And Bird looked at me, said, big homie, what's up, big homie? And Bird walked to me, we embraced, shook hands. This is my little homie Bird from VNG. Bird's one of the one of them ninjas over there who's regulating them. So when I see his little bird, I look, see a couple more little homies from VNG. I said, ah, oh, these little homies, I, I know them. So bam, I pull my pull my vehicle on in, shut the gate, I'll be back. I'm finna holler at you, little homie. Let me, let me holler at them, see what's up, I'll be right back. So I go in there, and as soon as I walk up, Chino introduced me to Bun. I, he take me straight to Bun trailer. I go in the trailer and he introduced me to Bun, introduced me to Bun wife, introduced me to Big Truck, which was the bodyguard at the time, security, Truck Buck, and the road manager, Bone. All them in the trailer. So he do his introduction, introduced me, shake hands with him. I told B, man, from this point on, don't worry about it, I got y'all. And whatever y'all doing right now in Cali, don't worry about shit from this point on. I got you. You on my name. I got you, bun. I got you, homie. UGK, I got y'all, bro. Pimp C, I got y'all, my nigga. So boom, I left from there. I went out the trailer to holler at the director. So as I'm going out, I said, who, I told Chino, I said, who the petty cash holder? Who the producer and who the petty cash holder? So I'm knowing my shit. I know who, who all the players and what to go say and who to get at. So merely. When I said where the petty cash holder and where the producer at, and then I said, who's the director? He walked me over here, introduced me to Teeth. When he introduced me to Teeth, Teeth explained it to me, hey, bro, I'm from Texas, brother. I don't know what's going on. I know it's politics in LA, man. I, I, hey, I don't know what's happening, bro. We just trying to shoot this video, get this video done, man. What's going on? I said, well, look here, man. It's like this here, homie. Who y'all get permission for to shoot this video? They looked at me. Looked at each other. Snoop, Insane, which is his bodyguard, Papa, couple motor homies, they inside the warehouse area. So when I get through talking to Dr. T, I work my way in there, holler at Snoop and them, get a Snoop, walk up Snoop, shake Snoop hand. You know, Snoop know me personally. We know I know Calvin from Death Row days. So we shook hands, boom boom. Tell him shit, I, I got it. It's cool, I got it covered. I leave out. But when I, when I talk to Dr. T, Dr. T specifically tell the producer and the petty cash holder, give him whatever he need, whatever he say, give it to him. However he said, just make it happen. 
I said, I got it, my nigga. Don't you I got this. So now what I do is I go out, pull bird to the side. I walk up to the little crips, the five, the, the I want I want to say the five five hustlers, the hustlers. I, I think it was them hustler niggas, man. If I ain't mistaken. But I walk up to them. I say, hey homie, who who the regulator? The nigga said, me right here, low. I said, grab one, one more of your niggas, man. Who who behind you? Grab one more in. He grabbed another one. Of them. I said, Bird, bring one of the little homies. I bought them in the gate. Right? Boom. Bought them in the gate. I peeled them. I peeled Bird off too. Peeled off the little crypt too. I said, I need y'all to secure the situation right here. Right here. If y'all want to continue to work the rest of the day, then they're going to switch locations, bro. Y'all got to travel with them. They're going to give you some more money. But I need y'all to secure this church right now. I need to make sure they're going to be able to get these scenes done and it's clearances right now from y'all words. Oh, it's done, big homie. It's done the only trip. Now, they got to go deal with the rest of the wolves. Whatever they get, they wolves, that's on them. But I know I maintain the individuals who got say so. That's what matters. I ain't worried about the wolves. It's the, it's the cats with the seniority. You feel me? So once I clamper that down, it secured the situation. They came on out their trailers, finished up the shoot, shot the sh shot the shoots, uh, the shots they needed at the church. We packed up, we moved from there downtown to the warehouses in downtown. They shot the rest of their scenes there. That's when I did the cameo in the video. That was my actual first video. Me and Bun got a couple videos together that I did cameos in, but that was my actual cameo in the first video I did with Bun B. And that was our relationship. That was the beginning and established was Two Trill West and Two Trill ENT, me and Bun B, bro. And we had a run for like 12, 13 years. Uh, our business um, contract, our business buying and everything just kind of like flourished out in the last couple of years. And um, I just, I, I, I have a different vision when it comes down to film and my film career to the point where I just, I just decided, you know, I've had a lot, I've had a good run in my music, as far as the music aspect. Let me really put it out of this energy back to what's a passion for me, and that's film. And so I, I, I've been doing this film and doing my film everything right now. Do, I'm, that's my whole goal set is just really getting my resume and my f film career back off the ground and getting my film and everything up and running, man. This is why it's important for me to get the truth out there, get the truth movie out there to everybody. But yeah, that, that was the, um, the opening and the, the beginning as far as um, me saving the day Mike Jones getting robbed and Snoop getting robbed and uh, Bun B getting robbed in Los Angeles and V and G Hood. That that's a known fact. That was something that was in the process of taking place. And I came in and I shift everything and I, I shut it down. And he ain't the only one. I you know by the way you know what I'm saying that you know that that I've I've put myself on the line for like that. You know I you know I can tell you score. You know, it goes on, you know, to, to the late great Scarface, you know. I can tell you the time when Scarface came out here and got robbed, you know what I mean? Straight up, you know what I mean? Literally robbed, you know, by some, you know, and nothing against the LGBT community, but, you know, some homosexuals robbed him, man, at that, you know what I mean? And that pissed me off. That kind of really pissed me off, man, that, you know, he even allowed that to even happen, take place like that. So it's like, it's just crazy to me how How'd you, all that happen? You know, it's another day, another story. Well, well, but basically, it's like this, man. I, I co-starred in a movie that he uh, produced. His homie wrote. A1, his homie wrote it. Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Homer the Third from Houston, Texas, wrote this movie called Consequences. They changed the title name from Consequences to Young Caesar. I co-starred in the movie. I played Big Zuni. Sean Blakemore stars in the movie as the lead. Dominique Daniels stars in the movie as the second lead, as young Caesar. Face was in the movie originally. They cut him out of scenes, cut his scenes out of the movie. So I got the original masters, bro, right now at home in my, in my, in my, in my, in my vault. I got the original masters to this movie because I went and took the masters from the producers for Face. But when I went and got the masters, they didn't give me the original masters. They gave me a dummy master. They gave me a copy master. Because now the original masters, they end up doing two more different editing cuts. So the actual original editing cut I got, I got the original first editing cut that we had for the actual film. I have that cut. Face is in that cut. You know what I'm saying? And Homer the Third. So um, what happened was he 
he, basically he put his trust in these cats, man, because you know Face didn't have no experience in the film world yet. You know, you know he was he has just finished doing his deal with with Ludacris. He has just set up this big deal with Ludacris and Def Jam. You know what I mean? Because I was there. I was I was I was on. I was with him. You know what I mean? I, I was with him for seven years, bro. So uh, so uh, um, during the time during the case when he when he was cutting his deal with Def Jam and them, he decided to do this film. So they end up giving him the money, they gave him the budget, uh, just a little bit under a million dollars for the project, for the film. And so these cats, uh, Michael New Day, Jeff Byrne, you know, uh, you know, um, they took it up on themselves, went back to Def Jam and got another extended 200 and some change added on the budget. So which extended to about a million, like a million, million point one now. Face didn't authorize that. So... Face found out they was doing some little squindling shit behind his back. So he called me. By this time, he on the road. And he called me. He said, hey, man, I need you to go down there and hell, holler at the boy, man, for me, man. I, they, they, they hit me with some funny shit, man. So I, I get on the phone, call Michael New Day. What's happening, man? I need to come down and holler at y'all. Boom. Not even a week later, too, he called me back again. I'm on the phone with Face. He telling me, man, man, he, nah. Uh, they trying to take my film, man. They whoop, whoop, whoop. They that they did did this. I said, so I said, wait a minute. I said, hold on. I said, face, you not, you not in on the editorium. You not sitting in on the actual project itself, and you are not hands in on it. He said, man, I put the project in their hands, man. I trusted the brother, man, such and such that he was gonna do what he's supposed to do, man. You know, I'm not familiar with this film shit, man, Cap, man. That's why I'm relying on you. I said, let me get on it then, man. So I do my homework, do all my due diligence, come to find out to a shit. They took the project. Took it right from under me. Took it. Shift the project, change the title, change the name. The project is originally called Consequences. Shift the title to Young Caesar. You feel me? And uh, <clears throat> reason being is <clears throat> that I say this as a fact it's because, like I said, when, when I went down there t to obtain the masters from them, they gave me the dummy copy. But then they had to turn around. They had to call me in terms come time for the music for the actual movie because I produced on the music. I produced. I was the music supervisor on the film. Me and Chino produced on the whole project. I produced 70 to 80 percent of the music on the movie. I produced. So they had to go through me to get the music clearance. So what I did was I negotiated myself a better situation. So I got paid again for the music and for published for the music that they couldn't do a release for as a, an international release without my clearance. So I did a domestic deal with them. You know what I mean? Okay. So <clears throat> as far as um, Face and Homer, like I say, they just ex them totally out about the situation. Took the film right up under them. Changed the title, changed the name. Um, change the credits. That the credit. If you look at the film right now today, Homer the Third is not even the writer credit on there, and that's his movie, bro. I know this for a fact. It's his film. That man wrote that film in Houston, Texas. His own blood, sweat, tears wrote that film. They took it from him and faced. Damn. You know, and so uh, when we when we started our productions, the week we were in productions, we were in the jungles. This was when Sparkles got robbed. The set of Sparkles got robbed by the same crew. They hit Sparkles' set. They hit our set spino, spontaneous, simultaneously. Excuse me. They hit us simultaneously. They hit Sparkle and them. Then they hit us. The reason why they came and hit us was because they left the set of Sparkle and them because it was a major, bigger set than our set. And then it was a bigger set. So they had police, more police over there. We, we only had a... Two, two bike officers and the rest was security on our set. So they worked their way over there at our set and robbed our set. Damn. Robbed our set. So I'm in my trailer sleeping. I just get to take me a cat nap. My relative just pop up. My homeboy Tone Kelsley pop up. And my homie E from Kansas City pop up. Now we in my trailer. We smoking and chilling. I got about another half an hour for I break us up. Face is in the trailer next to me. So it's my trailer, Face, then the actor Sean Blakemore, then you got Dominique Daniels, 
You got Richard Gant is on the trailer on my left. A trailer down from me is the great late uh, Richard Gant. You know what I mean? And um, so we in my trailer. We smoking and chilling. Next thing I know, somebody beating on my door. I open my door up. It's Chino. Chino telling me, hey, they in face trailer. They in face trailer. I go, who in face trailer? So I leave out my trailer, get the face trailer. I get up in face trailer. It's the black pea stones. The baby stones is on his head. They on his bumper. They just want to rap for him, though. They ain't trying to rob him, rob him. They just want to rap for him, right? So, <laughs> so when I get in the trailer, I hear niggas in there rapping. I look up. It's the young homie G-Nut. G-Nut is a YG from over there. Rest in peace to the little homie, man. We just lost little G-Nut too. But little G-Nut is rapping like a mother. G-Nut was the man at that time during the time over there from the jungles as a rapper. So G-Nut in that spit, he's flowing like a mother. I tell Face, this the little homie. This, this the one right here. So I co-sign for him, basically. So Face tell him, okay, daddy, man, but shit, uh, holler back at me, though, man. Let me go on and get this work in right now, man. We'll holler. You, 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 you know Big Cap, right? Yeah, okay, we gonna hook it up, man. We'll holler. I said, I got you. Now don't worry about it, man. It's my guy, man. I got you. And so, boom, they left out, face in the trailer. I go back to my trailer. Again, come back, hit my door. Hey, man, they robbing the crew. G-Nut crew, his, the, the, the other youngsters that's with G-Nut, they all on the set. They in, they in the, if you go to the jungles right now, you, you hit King Boulevard, it's a Jamaica spot right there on the corner before you hit Hillcrest. It's a little Jamaica restaurant. We right there filming. We in that spot filming. They go in there and rob the whole crew. By the time I get in there, they got Chino XL chain off his neck like this. And I stop him in mid air. I stop the little homie, right? As he taking the chain off his neck. And I grab the chain from him. Blood, let me get that, homie. I said, no, blood, this ain't this me right here, homie. Slow down. I said, nut, by this time, nut coming in behind me. And then nut signals the rest of the homies. Cause these dudes, they shermed up. All the young niggas looped up and high as hell. What's happening, blood? But that black piece don't like blood. They looped up. And I'm like, but these little homies though. So I maintain that situation. Chino XL running around in circles to my, man, I, I ain't the director. That's the director right there. So you won't? That's the director. <laughs> so <laughs> he trying to strip him off a of hill. So by this time, you know, like I said, I apprehend that situation, shut it down, get them some money as well. Because again, they did not go over there and get no permission, bring one of them guys in to secure the situation so that we can shoot these scenes. So I set the same situation up for G Nut and them and got them paid. Say the day, bro. That was the situation as far as um, the Scarface um, experience and the space moment as far as um, that film coming up missing an action like it did, man. You know? Okay. All right. Well, that's what's up, man. I mean, glad you got everything taken care of. It seems like you kind of stepped in quite a few times and were able to, uh, you know, calm a lot of situations, man. But... You know, you're best known, well, I don't know what to say best known, but you're very well known for your situation with Suge Knight. What all happened with that situation? Uh, we gonna go down that lane again, huh? <laughs> well, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make quick show fast, man. Bottom line is this, man. The world in which know this man as to be the most feared man in hip hop. I'm gonna say it again, hip hop. They didn't say the most feared man in the world, the most feared man in Los Angeles. He said the most feared in hip hop. And that's where you in TV land got it misconstrued and twisted at. Now here I come along, I'm 5'12", 6 feet, 200. Sure got me by 100 pounds, 125, 130 if that. Shit don't mean nothing to me where I come from. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. So I come from an era of turf where giants don't mean shit to us, bro. Feel me? That six foot six and 390 pounds don't mean a motherfucking thing to a real individual out these streets, bro. So for us, we didn't fear Shug. We didn't know no Shug. So what the fuck was we supposed to be in fear of a Simon and we didn't even know him. And even if we did know him, we wouldn't be in fear of him. So unfortunately, 
my first encounter with him and how I met him in my introduction and then we went on to become friends, business partners, and homies for the past 20 some years right now today. Ironically, we met on a negative level, bro. I end up, I myself, two of my homies were put in a situation, you feel me? Where, you know what I mean? The story D got it, you know, as they say, the story D, you can't distort the story D, man. You feel me? You can't do it from a nigga who does it his best. So what happened was, and what TV Land don't realize is, Simon was put in a position on a couple of cases in Los Angeles with a few real individuals out here in the streets where he met his match. And he had to find out that, oh, all these cats I got running with me can't stop everything and everybody like I'm thinking they can or like I thought they could. You feel what I'm saying? Meaning that not taking nothing from the homies, nothing from the power rules. Them was my home, but all of them was the homies. We all are, we grew up together. But here's was the thing with what the world seemed to not understand it and having a memory loss on. When it come down to Nixon Gardens, them bounty hunters, we were the hub of bloods, homie. We are the hub of bloods. We were the umbrella, homie. So when it came down to us, it ain't no such thing as, oh, individuals gonna run over us or they gonna run over the project, niggas. They gonna beat us up or beat us down or we inferior. If anything, niggas was inferior of us. They had a problem with us being around or, or too many of us, they know it was a problem. So I found myself in a situation. I was summoned to a meeting by some more OGs, west side and east side. I sit down at a round table and I was told that this is someone I need to shed light upon. This is what he's doing. This is where he's headed. Hmm, okay. And so from that point on, I established a situation with my homie, Rat Dog, rest in peace, me and Rat Dog, me and my little homie, Top Dog. And um, we established our own company called RB&D. I put the company together. I went and had everything um, incorporated. I did the whole package, everything. And so we established ourselves, RB&D, Rat, BJ, and Dude. So we took that production company and we utilized that production company in the midst of it is how we got our half a million up out of it. Feel me? I just didn't take a half a million from Simon like the internet tried to word and change shit around. We didn't just take a half a million cash or go in the office and bust a nigga upside his head and take a half a million cash, which if it came down to it, if we had to, it went like a nigga wouldn't, but it didn't, it didn't come down to that aspect and we didn't have to do it like that. We did it all based on from business and it was all in paperwork, in writing. She'll cut me a check, legitimately. Slid it to me and said, the only reason why I'm cutting this check is because of BJ and slid it straight to me. Rat dog sitting here, top sitting right there. Got the check, we left death row, got on the elevator together, smiled, grinned, laughed, clowned the shit out of each other, says on. Now all we gotta do is stay on our shit and get this release date and get this album done on our artist, our new group called Swang that I went and recruited from off of Jefferson. I recruited an R&B group, which was my first group in the business. I recruited this group with three brothers, one cat out of Chicago and two of them was from Los Angeles. And they sang their ass off. I'm talking about was blowing KC and JoJo and them ass out the water. So when I took them to death row, they would have been the future. So what we did, we turned around, we paid Uncle Mike a, 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 a substantial amount of money to produce on the album. So Vince and Teddy Rally was our main two producers and engineer on the album, on our album called Swain. So we, we produced one video, we produced a single. Our single was called Freaky, Freaking You. And, um, and then once we did that, um, I got shot up. I was in the element, got, I got hit with a K at the time. So I was back and forth. I was in a wheelchair at that time for about five years. And then um, we kind of, um, dispersed and departed in different ways because my interest was for, uh, for film. My interest was really based on film now. So I was taking a lot of my money and facilitating the film. Top, 
start building uh, on um, TDE and Rat Dog, invested into a couple of barber shops and started investing into shops. And then he was searching for um, an artist for him to manage. So we basically kind of just broke off and started doing our own things, our own entities. We all always still homies though, but we just forced our businesses. We decided just, and that was only because we had started running into um, the bullshit industry politics that we wasn't aware of at the time. So I, I was hands on learning a lot of shit. I hands on learned, but I learned fast. And so that kind of, and when, when Simon seen that, it was now it's coming from in house, from us and from the other side and the individuals we involved with as far as the producers and the engineers, and that we were having in house problems. Now he backed up and it gave him, it gave him an opportunity basically to take pressure off of him to be a backup from giving us an actual release date now. Because my whole goal was stay on his ass now, get us a release date. Once we get a release date on Death Row, we got an album that's actually released and it's out on Death Row, we can eat for the rest of our life now on Death Row. We ain't got to worry about nothing. We, we can do our thing. But the whole thing is to get this album released. Then during this time, my little homeboys, OFTB and them was signed to Death Row. Uh, young soldiers them came, they got signed as well. So, see, people didn't understand he was getting hit in different angles from real street ninjas from the streets, bro. Little Stretch wasn't no pussy. Big Y wasn't no pussy. Little Dog them wasn't no pussy. Little, little young rappers, they was young, but they weren't no punks. They was young, real gangbangers out the streets. You feel what I'm saying? So when they went to death row, them niggas was young riders over there, real gangbangers. Everything over there at the road was gang bangers or gang members, from the artists on down to the security to the damn employees. At some point, had some form of gang member, gang banging, or some affiliation involved in them. You know what I mean? That's just the way it was structured. So, my situation came about just as I said on hand that half a million that we got out of Simon. We got from a deal, from a production deal, based on our group, RB&D Productions. And we had to take it up a notch and um, push that situation up a notch because in the beginning, he kind of bullshitted on us. So this is where the segment you heard the rumors about him getting caught up in Nixon Gardens. That was me. Motherfuckers on this internet got it twisted. They got brain damage now. Niggas on here with, with um, and while I'm on here, let me say this to this, to this ninja, Reggie Wright, man. I, don't, I didn't want to say your name. I didn't want to come on this internet even mention you. As you notice, you done mentioned my name, fool, six or seven times, homeboy. And you don't know me, motherfucker. You know of me, but you don't know me personally. I don't play them games, Reggie. Police ass nigga, I don't play none of them games. Keep my name out your mouth, homeboy, because you don't know me. You wasn't at my gym in Nixon Garden when we did what we did to Suge, fool. You feel me? You better go ask them power rules that was around and ask them niggas. Any one of them niggas got a memory loss. Any of them. CJ and Bob Gotti wasn't even around. You talking about some Bob Gotti. And, and, and Bob, Bob, you know me, homeboy. Personally know me. You know I don't play them games, Bob. So I don't get on this internet to lie or boast or brag, man. I'm sharing my livelihood with society and with TV land. And what I say I stand on, straight up. What happened in Nixon Garden with Suge was me and Bonnie Hunter rat dog. It was me and Bonnie Hunter rat dog thing, and that's what it was. Period. Point blank, bottom line. And if Rick James was around, Rick James anywhere, Rick, see an interview or hear an interview, and Rick was there, Rick could tell, turn it all around and tell all you niggas, all you niggas is lies and know your lies, man. Because Rick James was the one that busted in the bathroom and got the door open. So what all happened? Suge was in the Nixon Gardens? Man, look, man, bottom line is this. I'm going to say this real quick before we, t before we close out. The bottom line is this, Cam. I knew personally from a couple of days of him shaking us and doing what he did and uh, him not coming through like he did, I said, okay, I got win. Two of my little homies came to me and said, big homie, you know they, they uh, death row shooting a video in the hood today. I go, who, what? Because I didn't know. I said, they shooting a video. Who shooting the video? They said, OFTB. I said, oh. Boom, I called Willie Doss. I blood. You know they shooting the video in the hood, which means them niggas going to come. They going to be here. 
that's his introduction to the hood because he ain't never been to the projects. And he got to come to the Nixon. This is, this is his last stop. If he can clamp the Nixon down, oh, he, he on his way. He really on his way because he got the bounty hunters with him. So he got to come to the Nixon to support the little homies in them that he signed to his label, OFTB in them. But what he don't understand and what he don't realize is OFTB don't carry weight in the projects as far as the street politics when it come to us. My little homies in them don't got no say so in the Nixon when it comes to the game theory in the projects. They are rappers and we support them to the fullest. Every show they did, man, we would travel hundreds of miles with them and would beat a nigga head in if they fucked with OFTB. But when it came down to us, me and Bonnie Hunter Rat Dog, it wasn't nothing OFTB and them could say to us to stop us from doing what the fuck we was gonna do. Especially me, man, or Rat. It wasn't shit nobody could say or do, man. It is what it is. So I told Willie Dog, he gonna be here. Some of the homies said he's coming. So I set everything up. Everything. Said little homies in the parking lot, little homies in the back of the gym. Feel me? Anything go wrong, we now late. Period. That was the day. So when he got there, little homie, uh, he live in he's, he he live in Detroit right now, but his name is BC. I did he did a drop on my show. He called me out the clear clear blue like, big homie, why why is motherfuckers on here acting like they got amnesia or something? Don't remember the shit that happened in Nick's Garden with you and Suge and Rat Dog. I'm the little kid that had the t-shirts that you told that nigga to throw the t-shirts. Get a to one of your bodyguards or something. Man, I walked right up to Simon, poked him in the back of his mother. I, I walked right in front. First, I walked up to him, hit him from the shoulder. Then I talked right in front of him, poked him. I said, blood, step in my office. I need to holler at you. He said, oh, man, I, I, I got to pass off these shirts. But pass the shirts to one of your workers or something, nigga. We need to holler at you, nigga. I was on my aggression tip just like that. Nigga passed the shirts off. He looked around. He looked at James. Looked over at another one of the security. And he turned around and he followed me and Rat Dog. As he followed, we walked in the little bitty gym. We walked the nigga straight in the boys' bathroom. Before I got in the bathroom, I told my big homie Hank and my homie Smut Dog, blood don't let nobody in the door. Don't let none of these niggas in the door while we hollering at this nigga. Don't let none of these niggas in the door. So as we going in, the big homie Hank, and two of the prior rules, they arguing. If I ain't mistaken, it's Big Hook, rest in peace. I know for a fact, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, not CJ, but um, uh, um, his brother, Walt was there, Big Walt there, because I looked right at Walt. Walt looked at me like, with the head now, like, B, we doing this? I'm like, what's up, homie? And I'm still pushing it in motion, doing what I'm doing, hollering at this nigga should. So they at the door talking to my big homies, Big Hank and Smut Dog. Smut Dog and Big Hank ain't letting nothing come through the door. So Smut Dog square off on one and Hank square off. And they stood there just like this. To but ain't nothing coming through the door right now. But they stay talking about, but we, we, we need to be in there with him, man. But ain't no. Rick James is little, sh short, and stocky. Rick came, slid between them, and dived at that. At this time, when Rick busted the door, that's when all the commotion broke out. When we had him in the bathroom, I, not Rat Dog, Top never said anything. Top was always just in the cut, just there, because he was the young homie, just chilling, playing his role. I did the talking, and I told him, Blood, this is what it is. We got a new group. We need to get this group signed on, homie, da da da. Boom. So now, as we talking, Rick James busted the bathroom. Sure, sure, no, PJ, Rat, PJ, Rat, hold on. And now it's commotion by him screaming, it draw commotion. So now they grab Suge. As they grab Suge, they pull it Suge and we grab the nigga. So now it's a tug of war. And finally, they pulled him and they got him. They hove him. They hove him. Hove him meaning they, they cover him, get over him. And they march him out. As they march him out, we coming right behind him. So when we get to the parking lot, I immediately, immediately turned to Mob James. Immediately, me and James squared off. I'm immediately at Mob James. As I say something to Jay, I see Jay already with the things. Because I already know my, from on point, I already know his, his pedigree, his, his, his get-am. So I already know. So off top, 
All you heard was It's the Bonnie Hunter Paru standoff in the park a lot now. It's guns everywhere. But them niggas wasn't leaving that day because I had it too spread it out. I had young homies everywhere. K's everything. Hold now. I had them spread it. Shut it down. Walked up to that nigga and told that nigga, give me the right number this time, nigga. And he gave me the right phone number. I said, I'm going to hit you in a couple of days, man. We hit him, set the meeting up, went to death row, got the check, and the rest is history. Point blank, nigga. And I stand on that with my life. And again, Reggie, right? You wasn't near, homie, to be speaking on homie my ass, but you wasn't near, Mr. Police Man. You was not there to be speaking on my name, bro. So please keep my name out your mouth, man. Like you trying to create something. You know what I'm saying? You want to create something, get it me. Get it me directly, because you don't know me. But I know who the you is. You and your daddy. You know what I'm saying? So on that note, man, I'm not finna get on this internet and be, like I said, I don't do the clout warn and going back and forth with you cats, bro. But man, you, you, you dudes better know who to play with, man, who to be with on this internet, man. And leave me the alone. And leave my name out your mouth, bruh. Because I ain't the one, man. I'm not this internet. I ain't from no internet, man. I'm from the streets. Nick's the garden to be exact. On that note, man, I'm out here. Nino Cappuccino, man. OE, live, man, in this bitch. Cam, we in this bitch, man. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your time, man. Dope stories, man. Your history, you know what I'm saying? Everything you talked about, man, is dope. Man, I, I, I definitely appreciate you, bro. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you, man. For sure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone News.